church you guys come ready to worship this morning let me know if you did or not how about y'all out in the lobby did you guys come out to uh, worship this morning or eat donuts what are you gonna do can we get them in here well we're glad you're here welcome to MCC my brothers and sisters Lord we just thank you for this morning thank you miss just bringing us all into this room this morning to uh, to worship and praise your name so sing along, clap your hands, stomp your feet, dance in your aisles, whatever you want to do this morning, and uh, give it all to him.
happen in this one. So, this song is called Undignified. I don't know if you guys, like, when you're in here, if you try to think in your head. I mean, as some of us do, we try to think in our head, what, what's, what's this song mean? Or, you know, why is it undignified? And why is this guy singing about this undignifiedness? And I was thinking about that this morning, and one of the things I was thinking about is, what's God really want from us? You know, uh, is he, does, he, does he want us to be so serious all the time? Or does he want us to have joy in our hearts for him? Yeah. You know, and I think that's one of the most understood things and the hardest thing to comprehend sometimes is what Jesus really wants from us. And I think that's what this song is about, is like, don't take yourself so serious. When you come and you worship, put your heart into it. Don't be dignified. Don't be, oh, well, I have to stay on the straight and narrow here. I can't really, you know, I, what Jeff is going to think about me because I'm having a lot of, <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun worshiping. And, and uh, you know, you can see this guy smiling and he's having a blast up here, which is what you guys should be doing when you come into this room, right? Are you guys with me what I'm saying? Yeah.
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for this joy set before him endured the cross. Jesus, we worship you alone in this place. We thank you for the mighty cross and the precious blood that has set us free.
Jesus. Father, there's nothing like the blood of Jesus Christ. We know that. It is a sa your saving grace, and it's a gift to us. So, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, that there is power in the name of Jesus, and there is power in the blood of Jesus. It covers all of our sins. So, Father, if there is anyone here that does not know you as their Savior, Father, I pray there is a tangible presence of Holy Spirit over them right now in Jesus' name. Whether they're here in person, whether they're watching online, Father, we just pray your Holy Spirit would be so consuming to them. I pray, God, for those that are struggling this morning, those that have had a stressful week, I pray your peace that passes all human understanding over them this morning. And I ask, God, that this morning, as they're finding your peace, that you would restore their joy. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as Mike brings the message this morning, that our hearts are in tune to what your Holy Spirit has for each one of us. I pray, God, that we have our ears tuned into what you have, God, ears that hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. I pray, God, that we will leave changed, forever changed, in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for the worship, Lord. I thank you for the worship team as they lead us every week. And I pray, God, your blessing over them and your holy presence that's here this morning. We just invite you to stay with us, Lord. Stay here with us. We praise you, Lord. We love you. We have expectant hearts bowed before you this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. If it's your first time here, please fill out the Keeping in Touch form. If it's not your first time here, I don't know what that is, but that's a nice effect. We maybe could use that for at the movies here next week, but what was that? Anyone else hearing that? Okay. I hear, I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, Keeping in Touch form. Fill it out. Again, if it's your first time here, go to the welcome desk at the end of the service, and we'd just love to say hello to you and give you a little mug and some other things. It's fantastic. Not your first time, just put that in the basket on your way out. Also on your way out, if you don't give online, you all, we also have that here too, if giving is part of your worship. All right, so we have Pastor Matt coming out here. He has a few things to talk about, so everyone say hi, Pastor Matt. Good morning. Any Star Wars jokes this morning prepared? Uh, I don't. I he should. doesn't. All right. I, I, maybe second service. Maybe second service. All right. Pastor Matt, everybody. All right. Real quick, if you have your cell phone, get it out. Show me your screen. Let me see any screens in the building. Come on. Come on. There's one. I see one there. There's one there. One there. Okay. All right. Open up your phone. Pull up the YouVersion Bible app. And now, if you don't have the YouVersion Bible app, what are you waiting for? Come on. Go into the store and download it. Uh, lifechurch.tv, I think, is the owner. All right, pull it up. You're going to, down at the bottom, you're going to see a Discover, if you're on Apple. If you're on Android, sorry. Um, hit Discover. In the search, you're going to put in MCC. MCC. I can spell MCC. Look at that. There's our church logo. You want to click on our church logo, and you get to decide whether you are an Elverson person or a Birdsboro person. There's a distinction there. And you can join our church on the YouVersion Bible app. That is so awesome. They just rolled this out. We're excited about um, this uh, option. We're excited about what's to come. They're going to be rolling out different options for us, different things that we can um, do together on the Bible app. So you'll see that our featured plan is different. Now it's 30 days with Jesus. 30 days with Jesus. Um, I, you still have to use the downloadable, the, the link. So you'll see QR codes on their way out. Um, if you click the featured plan, it'll ask you whether you want to do it by yourself or with others. Um, so just hold off. I will get you into the church-wide plan where we're going to be walking for the next 30 days with Jesus. We're going to look at some of the things that he did in his life and grow closer to Jesus because we're reading about Jesus. And there's nothing like drawing closer to Jesus through his word. Um, his word, there's power in his word. There's power in, in um, the, just learning about him. And so we're excited about that. So if you want to join Churchwide Bible Plan, scan the QR code on the way out. Shoot me an email, matt at uh, wearethatchurch.org. I will get you in. I will send you the link to join it. And we will read about Jesus together for the next 30 days. All right, I was given permission. Yeah, given permission. I'm going to sneak one in here for you. Uh, I would like to, a, a shameless plug about the uh, equip classes. We are doing, as you know, or well aware, we're doing Revelation on Tuesday and Wednesday. 
We are also going to be doing one on Sunday. It's going to be completely different. Uh, Sunday's classes, you know, a lot of times we, we close out the service. Bill will say, you know, uh, pray, ask the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, and it'll be an important question that we need to, like, be really thinking about the, the rest of the week. You know, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you about, you know, whatever in your life? And, you know, sometimes I wonder, do we know what the Holy Spirit sounds like? Do we know what that voice sounds like? Um, are we able to distinguish that voice from all the other voices rattling around in our heads? Well, um, this fall semester, uh, we are going to be talking about that voice. We're going to see what that voice sounds like in our own lives, because for each one of us, it's going to be different. And so the Quip class starts on um, September 18th. We're going to be doing the book, How to Hear God's Voice. I'll be teaching that class. It'll run to uh, about the beginning of December. So it's a very short class, very short semester. Um, I'm excited about it. If that is something that you want to jump into, put it on your Keeping in Torch form. Let me know so I know how many chairs to set up. Uh, and that way we can learn what that voice sounds like together um, because that is so important. If, there is nothing that's going to help you grow in your faith, grow in your walk with Jesus, is to understand what his voice sounds like in your life. So I'm excited about this class. I hope you are too. There, I know there was a bunch of people that missed it last fall um, just with commitments and stuff, so I thought I'll bring it back. So if you're interested, put it in your Keeping in Touch form, and we will learn about that voice together. Do I pass it back to you? Do I say? Well, that's all the time we have today, folks, so yeah. thanks for coming out. <laughs> No, thank you, Beth. That's awesome. Yep. Um, speaking of which, life groups and all that start on family night, which is September 14th. So not this Wednesday, the following Wednesday. But this week, we have Rise coming up. Who's excited for Rise? It's awesome. So we have a quick video about that. So good morning. My favorite part of RISE is when we have all the community get together and just watching them have so much fun. My favorite thing about RISE is watching my kids ride all the fun rides. I love the funnel cakes and the fried Oreos. Uh, my favorite part about RISE is probably the food and then seeing my kids clean up on all the games and being blessed with all kinds of new toys and other carnival paraphernalia. Funnel cakes and Jana D Farms iced coffee. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? All right. So, all right. So, hey, if you didn't notice, we have Rise coming up this week. This is one of the easiest ways to get somebody out. This is an open invite to the community to be able to come out and actually come to MCC, but for fun and have enjoyment. Not that Sunday mornings usually aren't fun and enjoyable. But at least that's what I, you know, I think. I think they are. But... Anyway, Rise is an awesome way to be able to say, hey, why don't you come on out? Visit our church. We have a carnival that's happening there, and we'll have a good time, fun time, and lots of food. So come on out. So welcome this morning. Um, welcome to this beautiful Labor Day weekend. Okay, we have a three-day weekend, and it's very enjoyable. So with that being said, if you guys are like me, I actually have, I don't have Star Wars jokes. I don't tell little humorous quips, but what I do know is, and I love, and one of the secrets that you might find out about me is that I love information. I love to learn. I love to find out new things. Sometimes they're pointless. Sometimes they're absolutely stupid and have no bearing in life whatsoever, but I enjoy them. And it's sometimes just so I can throw out just little like, hey, did you know this? 
just for that fact. And just I enjoy doing that. So it's not self-promoting or boasting, but it is one of those things that I just love having information. So I actually wanted to share a little thing with you. Did you ever wonder why we actually celebrate Labor Day or how it got started? Well, did you know that Labor Day actually started September 5th, 1882? And it started because 20,000 New York City union workers were disgruntled about their working conditions and took to the streets and in protest, which in turn actually turned out to be the first Labor Day parade. Hmm. And did you know that actually Canada celebrated Labor Day before the United States? Oregon was actually the first state to recognize Labor Day, and that was during a time when individual states chose to celebrate it until Grover Cleveland signed it into bill that it would then become a national holiday. Did you also know that the first Labor Day was actually on a Tuesday? And it was because of the employers and the business owners that decided to change it to a Monday so that way they could give three-day weekends to everyone. And lastly, the one that probably most of us are all too familiar with and most of us know is that it's the unofficial end of summer. Mm, okay. So, <laughs> all right, so if you wouldn't mind, let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we could be here, Lord. And I just pray for, to be able to, be able to, I'm blessed to be able to speak your word, Lord. And I just ask that I convey this in a manner that is embraced by everyone, but also open our hearts and open our minds to the, what you can do in us. And, Lord, I just pray for our time. I pray for the people that are here, Lord, and I just pray for this day. And I pray this in your name. Amen. So today's verse that I'm going to be using is actually one that's very familiar to many people. And even if you aren't a church-going person, even if you never cracked, cracked open a Bible, you may know this passage of Scripture. Because for one of many reasons, it's actually one that's found in weddings. Okay, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13 today. But by the end of today, there might be one of two things that either transpire. And one of them is either you're going to feel like you're in a wedding just because of the verse that we're using. Or... You might feel like you're a part of a hostage negotiation. Kind of sounds interesting. Kind of sounds like two ends of the spectrum. Hopefully, you've never been in a situation where you're at a wedding that felt like a hostage negotiation, but you never know. With that being said, though, the reason why I say that it might feel like a hostage negotiation is because back as I was preparing, I was reminded of a time back in 2019. Yeah, it feels like it's been forever ago, but yet it was only a few, it was only, what, three years ago. And it was at a time when I had the opportunity with a few other staff members to go out to what was known as the GLS or the Global Leadership Summit in Chicago. And if you're not familiar with what the GLS is, that's, it's an opportunity where business owners, corporate business and ministry leaders from all over the world come together and share their insight, how to survive and how to thrive in either business or various forms of ministry or anything in that matter, just to share their insights on how to do life and overcome and achieve at what your goals are. And what was amazing was that you had people that were there from Disney, Apple. You had people that were there from, um, Craig Rochelle was there from Life Church, the people who made the Life, uh, the Version Bible app. So if you ever want to get that, he's the one who actually helped start that. But there was one guy that was in the middle of it that was kind of interesting. Now, he was a CEO, but one of the things that was different was that he actually came out to speak about what it was to be a hostage negotiator. Now, it's like it didn't seem like it fit at first because you had all these business leaders. Craig Rochelle was there and all these people, but he's there talking to us how to succeed in life and treating life as if it was a hostage negotiation. And he said the way that you achieve that is that if you treat that as if it were a hostage negotiation, that there's skills, there's ways to get through different things in life that you can use these skills. He said, because you see, 95% of all people are wired very similar to, the same, to, the, to what we desire. And the reason that is, is because what we do is that we all desire one thing, and that's a relationship. He said, if you go into any kind of, like even a hostage negotiation, and he would give us these different formats and everything else where he would go through this, and he would say, you go through it and you build a relationship with the person that you're on the other end with. Okay, whether it's a guy that has a family of, of three hostage, you go in and you still ask the same questions because that's how you build that relationship. You build that trust because you ask questions. You ask the who's, like who are you and who do you think I am and, 
And then you ask the what's, and like, what are you doing? What are you hoping to achieve? What do you plan to get out of this? And it's not until you get to the last question, the last series of questions, and that is the hows. When you get to the hows, that's when it's usually at the part where they're at the bargaining part, the, when they're trying to get their demands met. Like, I want you know, a briefcase of money at this location with a helicopter at this time. And the negotiator says, he's like, well, how am I supposed to do that? By doing this, you're actually putting what you think you're giving. See, the negotiator thinks, or I'm sorry, the, the terrorist or whatever thinks that you've given him the authority. He thinks that he's in control. When in reality, the guy on the other end, the one, the negotiator, is still the one that's in control. The one that's asking the questions is still in control. But you see, what happened is the trust has been gained. The relationship has been built. The rapport has been made. But he did say one thing. He said that no matter where you go through negotiations, whether it's with a hostage, whether it's with your teenage child, you never ask the one question, and that is why. You see, why is a trigger word. Why is a word that will send somebody over the edge because you get defensive. The walls will go up, the ears go closed, and you kind of get back on your heels. And the reason for that is because of what happens when we're parents or, or when we were a child, our parents, the first thing that they ask us is why. You know, why did you stab your brother with a rusty fork? Why did you think it was a good idea to, to cut off your sister's hair while she was sleeping? Or why did you think it was a good idea to slide down a set of steps on a mattress? All these things are questions that we get inquisitive by why, why, why. And what it is, is it, it creates a very defensive. It creates you, it develops a trigger word. Why is that thing that for many of us anger us and put us over the edge. So with that being said, and as I said, that this is going to be part of a hostage negotiation today, or a wedding, depending on how you want to look at it, hopefully not both, I'm going to ask you a question. What is your why? Now, when I'm asking what is your why, it's not meant to send you over the edge or hopefully not trigger you, but it's really to actually question you and ask you a question of, why do you do what you do? You see, all too often when we hear that word why, we feel threatened by it and we feel like it's somebody questioning our intentions or our motives, when in reality, most of the time, somebody, the other person that's asking just wants to have an understanding or wants you to think about what you're doing. You see... I'm also not asking the question of what your why is based upon to upset you or tune me out, because hopefully you're not tuning me out, and hopefully you stay with me through most of this, if not all of it, um, but, because I, I promise it gets good. <laughs> um, but, you see, I feel like this runs parallel to what Bill was talking about at last week at Action. Bill said something last week that kind of made me think that, that could work for this. Because you see, what he said was, he goes, we live in a society or a culture that is not others-focused, which is very true. And I feel like that's where we are at as a society. But I want to ask it the other way, or I want to make the statement the other way, and that is, I feel like that we are living in a very me-centered culture, or a very me-centered society. You see, all too often, when we have these kind of situations, we tend to ask the question, what can I get out of it? You know, like when you are going through something and you want to do something for somebody, the first thing that you ask is, well, what am I going to get out of it? Or what am I going to walk away from in the end with? But that's not how we are supposed to be, and that's not how the gospel is supposed to be. Okay? Because the other side of it is that we tend to ask, well, this is what I feel. If somebody wrongs you, this is what, well, this is what I feel, and this is how you hurt me. The other thing that we tend to have the wrong perspective on or we tend to think is, well, this is what I feel as though is right. And if you don't agree with me, we're gonna, I'm going to cancel you. Or I'm going to get rid of you. I'm going to delete you. I'm going to unfriend you. I'm going to unfollow you. These are all the things that we do if you don't feel as though I'm right. Because what happens to it, and it gets to the end of it, is that we tend to put ourselves and say, well, this is what I think to be true. 
or this is what I think to be right, or this is what I believe to be true. And when that happens, we've already established our, what we feel as though is right and wrong. And if you would disagree with me, you hate me. You don't like me. And I don't need you in my life. You see, what is your why can be established by very many things. But when you have what I feel or what I think and what I feel, the thing that comes out of our mouth is what I view to be right. You see, the, the common denominator in every one of those statements is the word I. And this is where we feel. And that's why we, as a culture, and I say we, tend to deviate from what the Great Commission said. The Great Commission said, go into the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that was to be able to establish to come to Christ. The last time I checked, the gospel was empathetic, and it was not apathetic. And when we have a, this is me personality, that's very apathetic. This is what we can do. Now, the other thing that happens when we have our why, and we question our why statement, is that our why tends to become distracted. We tend to get distracted from what our true why is, even if we have it established as this is our why and this is what I believe and this is what I feel to be right and I follow Christ and this is what I do. But sometimes our why gets, become, we become distracted from it. C.S. Lewis once said that Satan's never going to try and prove that God is wrong or prove that God is not real or prove that there is no God. What Satan's going to do is he's going to try and distract you from the truth. This interesting thing is that was written back in like 1945. Think of all the distractions that we have nowadays in our lives, in our culture, in our society that pull us away from who God really is. But you see, our why, there's a formula to our why. Our why all too often is made up of simply three things. And that is all too often the things that we say. You know, you say to yourself, well, why do I say what I say? You see, the interesting thing about what we say is also we have a tendency to talk about the thing that we're most passionate about. Now, to go along with the little quips that I had at the beginning of the Labor Day, the little tidbits of knowledge, the, whether it be in the unofficial end of summer, it is also the unofficial beginning of football season. Okay? Now, I'm not picking on anybody. Trust me, I'm not. But you know that every conversation between now and February is going to deviate between what the Eagles are doing, what the Giants are doing, what the Cowgirls are doing, and what the Washington, whatever their, whatever Washington's name is now, whatever they're doing, because it's all our division. But needless to say, that's going to be leading in every conversation. You know, the other thing that's going to happen very soon is we have politics about happening. Oop, I said the P word at church. So, that's going to derail our society again come November. The other thing, I mean, for me, if you want to know something about me, I love music. If you, I could have hours of conversations about music. People love movies. They'll talk about every Marvel movie that ever existed and talk about every Easter egg that happened between the first one and the last one and then the ones that come because that's what people enjoy. That's what people talk about. They talk about the things that they're passionate about. Now, the other thing that builds up our why, the second thing that builds up what our why is, and that is the things that we do. We have to ask the question, why do I do the things that I do? Well, in most cases, we do the things that we do because they make us feel good. Okay, many of us actually like to go out and enjoy nature. We love to go out and enjoy God's creation and love that because the amazing thing about that is I know I feel closer to God when I'm out in nature. But many people like to go hiking. Some people like to go camping. Okay, that's all getting out. Those are the things that people enjoy and the things that people do. Some people love to serve because it makes them feel good. Caring for other people, taking care of others is an amazing way to serve. But ultimately, those two are almost foreshadowed by the third thing that makes up your why. And that is what I believe. You have to ask sometimes, why do I believe what I believe? Because all too often, we believe what we think to be true. Now, I'm not asking you to question your faith. I'm not doing any of that. But what I'm asking you to do is ask the question, what I believe 
and why I believe what I believe, does that come through in the things that I say? And what I believe, does that come through in the things that I do? Because you see, the overall thing is that everything that we say and everything that we do and everything we believe needs to align at some point in time. And the interesting thing is that there's one thing that, there's one common denominator that makes us who we are, and that's where if our why is based upon the things that we say and the things that we do and the things that we believe, then we have to ask, is the gospel visible in our why? Now, if you haven't tuned me out already, hopefully you haven't, and if you haven't gone off the edge because I keep asking why, 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 and, well, I'm sorry, there's going to be more of that to come. But I'm not, I'm not, my hope and my, my intentions are not that. I don't want to upset anybody. And as far as me asking the questions of why, it's not for me to ask you. My hope and my intentions are that you're asking yourself that. And the, the point of today is really asking you to do a self-examination on yourself. Do a self-examination of where you are at. Where is your walk? And making sure that what you say and what you believe and what you do all align with one thing, and that's Christ. Because at the end of the day, we all have the same mission as Christians. Okay? And we have to ask our question of, does our why help or hurt the Great Commission? So with that said, and as you're thinking about that, and as you're wondering what the Great Commission, and understanding that we are out to save souls, and we're out to invite them into our body, I have to ask, why are you at church? Why do you, why do you come to church? Now, for some of us, we come to church because we love the worship. The worship in the morning is amazing. It gets our hearts bumping. It gets everything moving. We are able to praise. We are able to feel the Spirit during that time. We'll be able to open our hearts and open our minds to be able to receive God's Word during that time because that's what it's supposed to do. That's why worship is in the beginning because so, it's supposed to relax. It's supposed to open you up and be able to accept God's Word as it is spoken from up here. Or are you that person that is here just because it's the thing that you do every Sunday? You come in, you punch your ticket, you, make, you, you do your due diligence for every Sunday, and then you say, yep, I'm still a Christian, I go to church on Sundays. Or are you that person that's coming here to say, I want to grow deeper in my faith, I want to have a develop a bigger understanding, a greater understanding, and understand who God is and what Christ did for me. Or are you too preoccupied sitting in your pews worrying, or sitting in the rows here wondering what the person sitting next to you, in front of you, or behind you is saying about you, or wondering if, like, at least I'm not like that guy over there or that one there. I don't have to worry about that. Or are you that one that's on fire for Christ that has nothing but that burning desire to want to get out and share his word? And you're coming here every Sunday to find out how can I get out and share the word of Christ? Or are you that one that's sitting here saying, I'm good just you know, consuming it and I'll just stay here? Because like I said, after all, our mission is to go out and share God's word. See, that was one of the things that, all those things were very similar to the things that Paul was faced with during 1 Corinthians. When he wrote 1 Corinthians, now understand that we refer to 1 Corinthians as a book, and it is a book, it's a book of the Bible, it's one of the 66, but also have to under, understand and identify that it is a letter, okay? And what we do with a letter is that we read a letter from beginning to end. You never read page 6 before you read page 4, and you don't jump to page 10 before you do that. So my challenge for you this week is to read through it from chapter 1 to chapter 16. It's a challenge. It's very easy. If you're not a reader, then listen to it. Get the Uver I'm, I keep plugging the Uversion Bible app. I'm not really trying to, but hey, you know what? It works. You know, do what I do. I actually sit there and read it and listen to it at the same time sometimes because it helps me develop an understanding. It reads it. Sometimes when I hear something, I think of it better or differently than how I read it and vice versa. So that's my challenge for you. And if you really want to get down to it, it'll take you about an hour and 20 minutes to actually listen from beginning to end. 
Because you see what happens is, as we, as we do with a lot of scripture, 1 Corinthians 13 is one of those ones that we cherry pick a lot. Because like I said, we hear it at a wedding and it makes us feel good because it's love is patient, love is kind. These are all the things that we know and we're guilty of because I know I'm guilty of it too. I had it at my wedding. But at the end of the day, it wasn't intended for that. You see, 1 Corinthians follows the same, a similar format that most of Paul's letters follow. And that is, if you, if you ever read them, it's like, it starts off like, hey guys, you're doing a great job. I love the faith that you have. But you know what? You're kind of uh, screwing up here. And you know what? Now you're really screwing up and you're distorting the faith, you're distorting the gospel, especially the guy over there. Get rid of him out of the church. But this is how we're going to fix it. He goes through all the things. He commends them. He points out the flaws, sometimes more stricter than others. And then he'll tell them how to fix it. And then he'll always close with, hey, I'll see you next time. But that's a traditional format of a Paul letter. But in this case, and this time it's no different. You see, the problem was that the the Corinthian church was a church that he established along the way of one of his many missionary journeys. But during that time, he would catch wind of that they're really screwing up. They're distorting the gospel. And And the primary reason was that they were letting the outside culture into the world into the church. The world was finding its way in. It was allow- they were allowing the world to distort what Scripture was saying. You see, they were getting down to the point of rivalry so much so that they were fighting over the best speakers. Well, I like Paul. Well, I like Apollos. Well, I prefer Peter. They would have arguments of the politics of, about with the different Caesar or Nero and all those different things, or even a matter of just arguing over the different ways to perform the different spiritual and religious duties. There was sexual misconduct on very many levels, not just one. But the one that was actually the most hardest to read and hardest to take, and I can understand why Paul's disgust with it was, was that they were even marginalizing the people that would come to the church upon their spiritual gifts. God, the Spirit had given these people gifts, and they were arguing over which one was better for the next one. Well, I have knowledge. Well, I have wisdom. Well, I have healing. Well, I have faith. I have miracles. Well, I have prophecy. Or I distinguish spirits, and well, I have tongues. They were split over the simple things of what the Spirit had given them. And Paul was like, guys, listen, you're doing this wrong. And he kind of goes into, as he pre, as he, as he's about to, as he's about to (laughs) get into 1 Corinthians 13, he says, listen, guys, I love your passion. I love your zeal. I love what you're doing. But here's the thing. And he says, in verse 31, 1231, it says, but desire the greater gifts and I will show you an even better way. And that's what he was saying. He was saying, like, listen, guys, your gifts are given to you from God. They're all a manifestation of the Spirit. Each one of them was given to us for a reason because what was happening was that if they're marginalized, if they're separating each other out based upon the gifts that God had given them, they're doing it all wrong. They're not displaying affection. They're not displaying grace. They're not displaying mercy to one another. But what they were doing is they were creating division amongst them. And Paul's like, no, it's not like that. You gotta, you are all the body of Christ. And this is, that, this is that passage in scripture where he's there saying, he's like, listen guys, does the hand argue with the foot? Does the nose argue with the ear? Does the eye argue with the nose about who is better? No, because they all make up the body, they all have one goal, and they all have come to the end, and they all have one end result, advancing the kingdom. And as he leads into it, he comes to 1 Corinthians 13. And he says to him, he's like, guys, your passion is there, your desire is there, but I want you to have a deeper and more of an understanding about what it is that you're missing. You see, Paul goes on to explain to them, he says, your gifts were given to one purpose, and that is to advance the kingdom. 
but ultimately you need to do it in love. Love is that key ingredient. That's that one thing that you're missing. It's like having a recipe, and at the end of the day, it's like, oh, it's miss- something missing. something's missing from this. And in this case, it was love. They were missing love. And the interesting thing is that one of us, all too often, we overlook what the true definition of love. And one of those things that we need to obviously care for each other. And that is, love needs to be the greatest gift that we not only receive, but we give out. Love is the reason why we have received God's grace and mercy, but we need to distribute it just as freely as it was given to us. The thing that we, that we as a society, as a culture, distort and pervert the word love in nowadays. Okay? We often look at it as, oh, I love this pizza. Well, I love these Oreos. Okay, yeah, they're all great and all, but at the end of the day, that's not love. Our culture has one word, love. Scripture has four words that represent love, and it breaks it down in four different ways. So for our misunderstanding of what love is, I blame our English dictionaries. Because you see, in Scripture, love is broken down in eros, which is that passion, the lust that we have. We have storge, which is that friendly love, the one that, you know, when you have friends that you'll do anything for. The phileo love, that's that brotherly love, hence Philadelphia. That's where they get that from. Phileo is a love that is from family. But this love, the love that Paul refers to in here, is the agape love. That's that unconditional, unresolving love that no matter what, you're going to care for somebody and you're going to love them. Another way that you can look at love is that love is not mere head knowledge. It's heart knowledge. And it comes from wisdom and understanding. This involves the process of discerning, discerning the will of God, which comes through putting oneself aside and becoming filled with Jesus and the Spirit. Many times when people wrong us or do things to hurt us or harm us, sometimes there's no intention there. There's no evil intention. There's no harm. But at the same time, there is. But no matter the case, we still need to step aside and say, there's still a child of God. Christ forgave those while he was hanging on the cross. What makes us any better than him? But back to to the Corinthian church. See, Paul was finding out that these people were speaking the word of God but they weren't doing it in a manner that was loving or care. You see, they were doing it for almost mere personal gain. So when you read 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. To have a deeper understanding of what that is, is that as we are going out and speaking the word of God, and we, if we're not sharing it in a manner like, oh, this person needs Jesus, let's go talk to them, but I'm not doing it in a manner that I really actually mean it, you're like this. You're actually speaking, and you're actually, this is what... If you didn't catch that. If you're speaking in a manner that's not loving or caring... That's what you sound like to God. You you're, are a clanging cymbal or a resounding gong, depending on your translation, that all it is is that it's an annoyance. Think about that. But Paul goes on to explain even deeper here. He's like, listen, that's what you sound like? Well, even if you have, in verse 2, it says, if I, give, if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all, all matters and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Think about that. Think about having all the knowledge that is in Scripture, even though that we will never achieve all that knowledge until the day we meet Christ. But the fact remains that even if we know this but we do not share it, I am nothing. And in verse 3, it says, and if I give away all my possessions and if I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. 
think of it. If you are going out to like homeless shelters or anything like that, or you're serving at soup kitchens or you're donating your clothes and you're one of those people that are out there posting your stuff on Instagram or posting selfies as you're doing this kind of stuff, do you really think that's what God wants? Now, granted, sometimes it's nice to be able to post that kind of stuff and be able to get the encouragement of others, but if you're doing it with your own personal gain in mind, I think you got it all wrong. But you see, the parts that we miss is what, kind of what John 3.18 says. It says, little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and truth. Let our action and our word be our why. And let our why be seen, what we're saying and what we're doing. That's what it needs to be. You see, that if we are pursuing recognition, or if we're doing things for our own glory and our glory alone, all too often, that's a false mission that's wrapped in a very nice Christianese type package. But that's not what it is. And that's what Paul goes on to explain. And he's like, listen, guys, you have the right motives, but you're doing it wrong. You're missing that one ingredient. I'm, and I'm going to tell you what it is. And it starts in verse 4. And now this is the passage that many people understand. But the part that I need you to understand, though, is that every one of these words that Paul uses here in this passage is displaying love as an action, not a feeling. It's not something, it's not something, it's a verb. We got to do it. We got to move on it. These are the things that we need to actually display. And in verse 4, it says, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep the record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but right, rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, the interesting thing about this passage is that, like I said, it's not a matter of what Paul tells us love is versus what it does and versus what it does not. But in reality, all of these things are aspects of things that we can control. Hence, I, what I said is that these are things that we do. We, we have the availability to say, I have love. I have patience. I can show kindness. I can show righteousness. These are all things that we have the ability to control. But not only that, on the other side of it, they are all, technically, they are all fruits of the Spirit. Okay? These are all things that we have been given the availability from the Spirit to be able to display and show, and kindness. And if we do all these things, our life will be probably less filled with strife and turmoil throughout everything. But here, I want to try and do a little exercise. And you guys can share it. You guys can do this outside of here. And I'll, but I'll, I'll demonstrate a little bit. In addition to challenging you to read the whole, the whole letter of 1 Corinthians, I also challenge you to take this passage and replace the word love with your name. Because then that's a true test of what you will say, whether I'm adhering to this, following this, or doing these things. You know? And like an example, I'll say, look, Mike is patient. Sometimes, except for when we're maybe we're running a little bit late, and, you know, I get a little irritable. Well, there's another one that I just, oh, shoot. You know? And then I'm not really that kind when I become irritable. So you see the spiral staircase that it goes, starts going down. That when you start seeing that, one will then lead to another one and lead to another one. But the even more interesting part that I think that Paul's trying to convey here is that he, re he essentially replaces the word love with God. Think about it. God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude is not self-seeking, is not irritable, doesn't keep record of wrongs, thank goodness. God finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. I think that's why we can, in 1 John, we can understand, 1 John 4, 19, we can understand what John was trying to say there when he said that 
We love because he first loved us. We were given a physical representation of what love is by what God did for us. Yeah, that's about the salvation message, but what better piece of love that we can have than that? But at the end of the day, since we know that God is love and love is from God, Paul would then actually explain a little bit further And I'll give us a deeper understanding in verse 8. It says, love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As far as tongues, they will cease. As far as knowledge, they will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. These are all things that we hold true to us. You know, we have the prophecy, we have the tongues, we have the knowledge, we have all these things. But when our time ends, that's when the partial becomes complete. When Christ either comes or takes us home with him, that's when our partial will be fulfilled. And these are when those things will then go away and we're left with one thing. We're left with God. And that's what he talks about. You see, until the day comes, we cannot have a full understanding of what it means to be able to see that. And Paul goes on to explain in verse 11, it says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. You think back to last week when Bill was talking, and he said that we need adults to become adults. You know, when we accept Christ, yes, we are those children, those spiritual infants. But as we grow, we mature, and we hopefully mature into somebody that is a, a devout Christ follower that is out there being able to, willing and wanting to share the gospel. Now, when we look in the mirror, yes, we see a reflection of who we were that probably hasn't changed much from yesterday, the day before, and the day before that. But at the end of the day, you can only hope that you've gained a little bit more knowledge. At my, at my previous job, I used to tell my guys, listen, don't waste your days. If you go a day without learning something, that's a wasted day. Every day you should be able to walk away with, I learned something new. Or I looked at something differently. But that's also the same reason why we do our devotions. We do our morning devos and stuff like that. We get in the Word on a daily basis because every time you open this book, you'll read something new. Even if it's the same verse over and over and over again, you will see it. That's why it's living. That's why it's active. And that's why it's sharper than any two-edged sword, because every time you crack it open, you will see something that you never saw before. And he closes out the verse. He says, Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now there's three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Do you ever wonder why they tote so much on love? Why scripture is always love, love, love. And out of the three things, we're always told to have faith, we're always told to have hope, and now we're always told to have love. But out of all those, love is the greatest of them? Think of it this way. As he's talking about what we know in partial and will become complete, as we know... is partial, and then we are fully known. When we were with Jesus at that time, obviously everything would be complete. Everything that we had faith in will be standing there right in front of us. We don't have to have faith at that point because Christ is there. And then everything that we had hope in, up to that point, having that hope in that faith that we needed so greatly will come to fruition. And we don't need it anymore. But there's one thing that we still remain, and that's love. Because we will be with God. And if God is love, then we will be with God and have his love and rest in his love. Because that's what we will know. At the end of the day, these people were arguing over the best gifts that they had. And none of them could compare, and Paul's complaint was, you're missing the key. You're missing the love. So here, all those gifts will go away, 
and one will remain. Love. So here's another question for you. Why do you believe? Now many of us are probably sitting here saying, well, I believe because Christ died for me. Okay, he took my sins. He bore them on the cross for me. He took my sin debt and wiped it clean. You know, I know these things. That's true. And if you're thinking that, awesome, because that's what you need to think. And that's what you need to believe. And that's what you need to understand. You need to hold on to that because that is that faith. That is that hope that you have, which will endure and breed that love. But even beyond that, not really a trick question. Why do you believe? Guarantee you it's probably because at one point, at one time, somebody shared the gospel with you. Somebody shared with you everything that you needed to know to have that understanding of what it was to be in heaven or to gain eternal life with Christ Jesus at the end of the day. Somebody took time out of their busy schedule, whether it is that or not, and shared that with you. That is why you believe. So if we have, somebody took that moment to be able to share what they viewed as the most important and the best gift that you could ever receive, why don't we share the gospel? Why don't we share it more? Many of us say, well, it's it's because it's too awkward. It's awkward to share the gospel. It is. But Dare to Share, that was one of, uh, one of our affiliates that we use in the youth ministry, is that they would say the phrase over and over and over again, well, awkward is awesome. And it is. Because you think about it. Awkward is what gets you out of your comfort zone. It gets you out of your little circle, out of your little bubble. But that's where the growth happens. And that's when you're able to share that much more. And you're able to get out there and be able to expose. But most of all, that is right where Jesus is using you. If you don't get out of your comfort zone, you're saying, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm right here. I don't need to get out. Get out of your comfort zone. Allow Jesus to work through you and into somebody else. Maybe it's frightening. And yes, it, is, it can be frightening the first couple of times because you're going to sit there and you're going to stumble. You're going to mumble words and you're going to be like, bah, 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 bah. it happens. It happens to the best of us. But over time, every time you do it, it's going to become easier and easier and easier almost to the point where you're going to be oozing it out. Many of us actually say that, well, I don't know enough. Possible. But the last time that I just said was that we won't know enough until the partial becomes complete. And at that point, it's going to be too late because then you, you've accepted your gift and there's many people that are still here. But when I asked what you believe and why you believe, like I said, many of you are probably sitting there, well, I know that Christ died for me. I know that he took my sins. Well, I know that, you know, God created us to be with him. Our sins separate us from him. There are, and there's nothing that I can do to remove my sin from him. Paying the price for our sins, Christ died and rose again, and everybody who believes in him has eternal life, and that life starts now and lasts forever. If you know that much, you know enough. That's the easiest way to do it. Share. But even if all those aside, every one of those isn't for you. My recommendation for you, live it. Live with the gospel. You know, live in such a way that people who do not know who Jesus is but know you will know who Jesus is through you. It's as easy as that. To some of us, the people that were around, we are the closest thing they have to a church. We are the closest thing that they have to a Bible. We are the closest thing that they will have to Scripture. D.L. Moody once said this way, out of 100 men, one reads Scripture, the other 99 read the Christian. There is no better way to share the gospel than in the close proximity of those you're around. Okay? The most impactful person that you can be is to those that you are around, whether it's your neighbor, your friends, or just anybody that you come in contact with.
The other thing is, many times that our why doesn't match up to what we believe. Or at least we don't think that. We act in a manner sometimes that as people are watching us, remember, people are always watching us, especially Christians. And they're always quick to point out the things that we're doing wrong. And that's what Paul was displaying here. He's saying that if you're not doing it right, you could go out and share the gospel up, down, sideways, in every way imaginable. But if you're not doing it out of love, that's what you sound like. You know, if you're going to work and you're saying that I'm a Christian, but you're acting in a way that's not very Christian-like, and I think we know what that means. If you're saying the things that we shouldn't be saying, but yet you're tooting that you love Christ, that's what you sound like. If you're a parent at home trying to share the gospel with your children or, hey, let's have Bible studies, but yet you're watching things on TV that you probably shouldn't be watching, let alone with them in the room, that's what you sound like. So this might be my final question. Why are you here? Now, it might sound like something that I've said before, like, well, you already asked that, Mike. No, I didn't. I asked what you believe, and I asked, why are you at church? Why are you here? This is not one to overthink, and it's very similar to the same reason, the one I asked you, why you believe. And that is because more than likely, someone asked you. You're here because someone invited you. I'm sure that some of you might have been driving past and be like, hey, I want to come, I want to stop there. But I, I'd almost be positive that most, case, most cases is because, hey, why don't you come to our church? Or, hey, we have a carnival here. Why don't you come see us? We have something for your whole family. Come join us on family night. You were invited. Many of you guys know who Steve McQueen is. He was a Hollywood bad boy back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, until he died in the 80s. What many people don't realize is that he was actually a Christian when he died. He wasn't throughout his life, though. But it wasn't until probably the mid-70s, and he walked away from acting. He walked away from Hollywood. He walked away from everything because by the end of it, he was empty. He felt like he had nothing. He achieved everything he needed to achieve, but at the end of the day, he was still empty. He had nothing. So he's like, I'm going to go... I want to do my own thing. It got to a point where so many movie companies were trying to get him back. They would offer him $50,000 just to read a script, and he would refuse. But at the end of the day, he, was, he got sick and tired of day-to-day -day life. Now, a few years ago, a pastor was at a missionary conference in Dallas where he got the urge to want to buy a replica of the Mustang that he drove in the movie Bullet. That Steve McQueen drove in the movie Bullet. He searched high and low, he found one. Didn't know why that he was so overwhelmed to want to buy this, but he did it anyway. He took it home, didn't tell his wife until he got home. Um, sure that wasn't cheap, uh, but because he bought that, he was then, well, I want to find out more about Steve McQueen. I want to dive into his life. Now, he was a pastor, and people at his church would come up to him and be like, hey, I know a guy that knew Steve McQueen. And the one guy was like, hey, I knew the pilot, the flight instructor that taught him how to fly. Because you see, when Steve McQueen got bored, he went up, I think it was Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. But he bought an airplane, bought a hangar, said, I want to learn how to fly. Maybe that'll help fill me up. And see, the pastor that was at this church found out about this guy who knew the, the flight instructor. So the pastor went and visited that flight instructor and said, well, tell me more about Steve McQueen. Tell me more about what you know. He said, well, I used to take him up, teach him how to fly. And one day, I invited him to church. And he said, he came. And then he came again, and then he came again. And before you know it, Steve McQueen accepted Christ as his Savior. And this was like in the mid-70s. And until he grew, 
up until his untimely, until his death, where he received that cancer diagnosis. When the cancer ravaged through his body, throughout that entire time, he had peace. He was filled. Everything that he did for the 30 years prior to that that left him empty, he was now filled because of that one invite that he opened his heart to accepting Christ. And because of that, he died in peace and in a joyful tone. Matthew 28 says, go into the world and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's our great commission, to go out into the world sharing the gospel with everybody. The great commission needs to be our mission. And not, our mission field is not halfway around the world. It's not in some third world country. Our mission field is outside those doors. There was a church that I had attended one time that said at the top, it says, you are now entering the mission field. Because that's what it is. Every person that we come in contact with, every person that we talk to, every relative, every person that's at Walmart, because we know they need it, everybody needs Jesus in their life to have the peace. They will be empty and destitute until that time comes. Christ is not a matter of rules and regulations that we need to follow. It's love. So for Christians, you Christians that are sitting here right now, why wouldn't you want to share the greatest gift that you've ever had? Why keep it to yourself? If you know the joy, the peace, the happiness that it can bring you, why don't you want to share it? On your seats, everybody was given something. A golden ticket. No, it's not Willy Wonka. But it could be the best thing that you could give somebody right because next week we start our At The Movie series. On the back of it, it has name, phone number, email. That's for the person that you give it to. Invited by, you can put your name there. Yeah, there's gonna be drawings for great prizes, but the best prize of all that you have the opportunity to give somebody the potential to receive the gospel of Christ. To have that eternal life that starts from that moment and lasts forever you have the opportunity to share the gospel so easily. So if you're one of those people that says, it's too awkward, it's too scary, I don't know enough, let us do the heavy lifting for you. Let us take that burden off your shoulders. And all you have to do is simply say, hey neighbor, why don't you come and see? Our church shows movies. Right now, we have a carnival in the parking lot. Why don't you come and see? Because that's the easiest way to share the gospel. Like I said, let us do the heavy lifting. Let us take that burden off your shoulders. You just get them here. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Lord, we praise you and we glorify your name. And Lord, we pray that everything that we do be done for your glory. Lord, we pray for the opportunity that we may be able to speak to one person that is here because we know that if one of us, each one of us speaks to one person, we multiply the kingdom. It's not about us. It's about you. It's about advancing your kingdom to save the lost, allowing us to understand that our mission needs to be the Great Commission and understanding that we need to save and seek the lost because it's not us that saves, it's you. And Lord, we just thank you for this. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us this gift. Lord, I just ask that we share it. And Lord, I just pray for us all in this day. I pray this in your name. Amen.
Make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself. Dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers. But all an empty world can sell is empty dreams. And I lost the light, and it was up to me. just thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for everyone in this room. Father God, and I just pray that all of us can leave here today with a message from you through Mike. Lord, that we would just learn how to be undignified and just go out and be proud that we know you. And we take those tickets and we proudly give them to someone else. So I just pray for all of us this morning that we would, if we're thinking about something to pray for this week, that we would pray for each other, all our own brothers and sisters, and pray for our church, that we can all be messengers for you, Lord, that we can just get out there and be all about you and not be afraid by what other people think. But Father, I just pray for our 
this congregation this morning that is here, that you would just bless us with that ability, that strength, that wisdom to have the right things to say. And Father, I just thank you for everyone in this room this morning. You guys have a great week. God bless you. And I